today, you know, and I still, sometimes I run into service companies today, Thaddeus, that are 20 years later, still not charging 335 an hour flat rate. You need to be charging what it costs to run your business, period. Hey, welcome back to another episode of HVAC Success Secrets Revealed with Thaddeus and Evan. Although if you notice, it's just me. If you looked at the screen, I did my best to put Machu Picchu on there. It's actually a llama, it looks like. Uh, but I went into Canva and it was Machu Picchu is what I searched because that's where Evan is right now. So he's enjoying some much needed vacation uh, time off. So diving into today, our guest, John Conway with Redwood Services. I am super excited for this conversation. Um, a little bit of a backstory uh, from him. He, he, he's been in the industry probably even before this, took over a business in 1998, sold it in 2010, went... Uh, I worked for them for four years, moved into Nexstar, uh, and was a business coach with the Nexstar Network for over six years, came on board as, in the last four years as the COO at Redwood Services. And they, uh, they're they actually a home service, firm, home service firm focused on investing in leading residential companies uh, within the HVAC plumbing and electrical space. Um, I asked him what his superpower was before we got going, and it was keeping things simple. I know people have a tendency to complicate it. And then he dropped four things which matter for a business, and I'm not going to tell you what those is. You, what those are, you've got to watch the entire episode for us to dive into those four things. I'm super excited, but without further ado, this show would not be possible, of course, without our sponsors. First up, we have Chirp Elite Call and On Purpose Media. So transform your home service business with Chirp, the ultimate automation toolbox. Capture more leads. Uh, capture more leads, uh, connect instantly, and skyrocket your sales. So Chirp integrates seamlessly with platforms like Service Titan and HouseCall Pro, offering automated text, emails, and even ringless voicemails. Boost your Google reviews and customer loyalty with your proven with their proven rehash program. So schedule your demo today and get an exclusive twenty five percent off your first three months. Visit chirp.com forward slash hssr today to get started. And if you ever thought about outbounding your, das- your database to fill your dispatch boards with lucrative service and sales appointments, well, now you can do that with Elite Call, a U.S.-based call center that does all of those things. For over 20 years, their dedicated teams don't just make calls. They directly integrate appointments into your CRM and fill your dispatch boards. Don't let your competition get ahead. Let Elite Call connect with your customers first. Visit EliteCall.net to learn more. And last, but certainly not least, On Purpose Media. Enhance your online presence with those guys uh, on Purpose Media, your go-to home service marketing experts for everything web design, SEO, PPC, stunning user-friendly websites built to convert visitors into phone calls, enhance visibility on Google, and effective pay-per-click ads, minimizing wasted ad spend. So let's turn your presence to a lead generating powerhouse. Visit onpurposemedia.ca today to start your digital transformation in the world. Without further ado, we'll be back on the other side. John Conway. Welcome, John, to the show. Uh, thank you for taking some time out uh, of your day. I know that you're traveling right now, um, so thank you for for that. So I'll uh, I'll get started with the the most toughest question of all. What 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 was your journey like? Walk us through the start into the HVAC industry. You know, uh, Thaddeus, it's it's uh, I'll I'll try not. I've been in the industry over thirty years now, so maybe I won't take you too far back. But I will tell you that. Um, I got in the industry working for my father's small new construction business that worked out of the sunroom of his home uh, in in uh, 1994, where he had one truck and two employees. And he thought it was a good idea if I ran duck work in new homes. By the way, I thought that was a terrible idea. Um, and so that's really kind of wh- where it started, um, you know, all the way up through um you know, me evolving into growing the business, going out and selling, you know, work to new uh, to home builders and, and then just growing the business as a whole um, and, and evolved into me um, purchasing the business from my father in 1998, um, you know, so roughly a, about five, you know, four and a half, five years later. And um, by that time, we had grown from the business being 300000 a year to it being two, you know, two million dollars a year. And, uh, and it was mainly new construction, you know, not knowing what we didn't know. Um, and, you know, running around in that new construction industry, sometimes just a race to the bottom, you know, just Mm -hmm. how cheap can you do work? And, and, um, so from 1998, I started, um, basically getting into the service and replacement business business, but just not charging the right price. And um, so that's, you know, if we start talking to me about price, you'll find that that's kind of where my passion's at. 
um, because the service and replacement business is, you know, a business that you have to charge the right price in. And, and I, uh, quite frankly, uh, I have this, this kind of saying that I, that I basically say, what's the biggest myth in the industry? And, and Thaddeus, the biggest myth in the industry is something called going rate. Mm. So I don't know if you've ever heard of, of going rate before, but, um, you know, going rate is uh, what's the going rate for Freon? What's the going rate for a three ton condenser? What's the going rate for a fan motor? What's, you know, what's the going rate for a water heater? Going rate doesn't exist. There really is no such thing as going rate. Or sometimes I'll hear people ask, you know, hey, what will the market bear? You know, right. the, the price that you need to charge for your goods and services is what it costs to run your company. Mm -hmm. So don't worry about what it costs to run heat them and cheat them. You know, worry about what does it cost to run your company? If you're listening to this podcast today, you're probably a, you're probably a professional service company. And if you're a professional service company, then, you know, charge a professional fee like, you know, Thaddeus, you could come to Memphis and I'd be glad to take you to dinner. And, you know, we could go over to the Wolf Chase Mall and and when we go to the Wolf Chase Mall, you know, we could eat we could eat dinner at Logan Steakhouse. The steak's about 15 bucks and the wait's about 10 minutes. Or we could go next door to Jay Alexander's and the steak's 40 bucks and the wait's an hour. So like, why are people waiting an hour for a $40 steak when they can get a, you know, a $15 steak in 10 minutes? Well, the reason is for service, atmosphere, mm -hmm. experience. You know, when you deliver those things in your business, you're able to charge for it. Um, so I met, um, I spent, I'll, I'll speed this up. I spent 1998 to 2004 digging a hole, not charging mm -hmm. the right price. Chasing I do want to get it. I do want to get into that. I think that'll be yeah. a fun one. Chasing builders on Friday afternoon to get trying to get paid, and um, and quite frank, frankly, I found myself in two thousand and four nine hundred and forty two thousand in the hole to carrier. Um, I tried to get them to sell me sixty more thousand so I could say I owed them a million, but for some reason they kind of thought nine forty two was enough, and um, and at that time I met Nexstar, I uh, joined uh, Nexstar and in May of 2004 and in February of 09, five years later, I was debt free, didn't know anybody a dime. And, um, and it was really through those Nexstar best practices. And, uh, and in 2010, um, I sold the Conway business. Some people said, why did you sell the business? The fifth offer. Um, that's why I sold the business. And uh, I spent four and a half years working for the guys that I sold to and um, enjoyed it. It was a, it was a good time, um, but I also felt like that I had a, uh, I wanted to give back to Nexstar. Nexstar had quite frankly changed my life. And so I wanted to give back to Nexstar. I had an opportunity um, to go to Nexstar as a business coach in 2015, spent six years there. And basically at the end of 2020, early 2021, I left Nexstar um, to come to Redwood Services um, with Richard Lewis and Richard's Redwood CEO. And, uh, and I was just quite frankly, really um, impressed with Richard's vision to invest in the home services industry, but do it in a very different way than what you see the big companies do. So we have a, you know, we, we, you know, we have a kind of a saying around the Redwood world, hey, don't do the stupid stuff, you know. So, you know, what's the stupid stuff? You know, you've always bought carrier equipment, but now we're telling you you got to buy Linux or you've always bought always bought train. But now we're saying you got to buy Goodman. So one, you know, just don't do the stupid stuff. And um, and just also think about, hey, how, how, you know, what a lot of the big companies do. You can pretty much imagine in the Redwood world, we try to avoid what some of the big companies do. But mm -hmm. Spent the last four years uh, at Redwood building something special. And we know that we're building something special. We started with zero partners at the end of 2020. And today, Redwood has 15 partners nationwide. And uh, we're absolutely having a blast. And our partners are doing great. The businesses are growing. And um, we don't have high turnover. Just about every manager that was in the business when we became their partner is still the manager today still managers today and all, all of our owners are in place. Um, I think all but except uh, one of the owners have one owner group retired. But other than that, 14 of the 15 owners are still in place. And so things are going incredibly well. So 
And lastly, hey, thanks for having me today. So let's have, <laughs> let's have some fun, my friend. All right, I'm looking forward to it. And so uh, I guess going back to the like the start of it in buying a business from your from your father, <clears throat> we've had a few people on the show that have have went through that before, and and obviously the emotional gamut that it could happen, and even maybe potentially dry, uh, driving a wedge in a family if it's not done the right way. Um, Walk us through, if somebody were in that same situation of, okay, I'm going to try to buy the business from my family so I can get my mom or my dad out and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to son or daughter, I'm going to take it over. <clears throat> what are some of the things that you guys did and put in place to be able to prevent that wedge from potentially being driven inside? Well, the, I told you when I joined, you know, working with my father, he had the one truck and two employees and was doing about 300000 a year in revenue and, and you know, four years later, we were in 1998, about 2.1 million, even though all of it was new construction. My, you know, the business was really bigger than my dad, even though it was a very tiny business in today's comparison, it was really a bigger business than my dad wanted to run. And so he kind of asked to, hey, can I go back and do my sunroom thing? And can I go back and do the small business thing? And by the way, all these builders that we do now are guys that you went out and got. And so it, we kind of just mutually agreed for him to keep the original builders that he had. And for me to, um, you know, for me to take the new builders that I had went and got. H however, as it relates to an exit strategy, if you, if you were to take that to today and maybe not an exit strategy, maybe a better way to put it is, is it relates to a succession plan. Mm -hmm. There, there should, there should be a lot of thought put into succession planning. Um, and, and first of all, you know, when if you have a, a larger business, when I say a larger business, somebody's got a business doing, you know, 10 million, 15, 20 million dollars in, in revenue. Well, in today's world, those businesses have a lot of value to them. And and quite frankly, it's typically more value than most likely a son or daughter is going to be able to pay. And so there is there is opportunities in the market where someone may want to think about, hey, should I have an investor take, you know, help with dad's equity and then also have some equity rolled to the next, you know, generation of owners, which happens mm -hmm. to be that succession plan model. So I think you should, you know, I think people should really put a lot of thought into how to succession plan their business, you know, um, because especially the larger companies, they have a tremendous value and you know there should be some thought put into into that for sure, sure. Um, and, in and terms I, of the the succession planning and putting that in place and even just exiting a business for 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 that too i mean and, and you look at kind of both of them i think there can be some some common pitfalls that people fall into um that are or even myths that that might be out there as well i mean you know you alluded to myths a little bit earlier in looking at um, succession planning on a business or even positioning to exit, what's the, uh, I guess, the, the, the largest single-handed mistake that some people would do in doing that, in doing it the wrong way, that they should avoid? Well, if you're, if you're looking to, well, first of all, not having a plan. So not, not thinking, not, not having a plan of, you know, I would, I would say also just making sure that you're communicating, like, what is the outcome look like, you know, and, and not having a, um, a, you know, a plan. The other thing is this succession or the exit doesn't always have to be about money. So if you make the succession and the exit all about money, I want to leave and I want to get as much money as I can get for my piece of the business. <clears throat> that sometimes doesn't always bode well for the business, you know, and so if you put too much of the emphasis on about the money and not as much emphasis about your legacy, um, I, I commonly will say like people that care about their brand and people that care about their legacy and care about their people, they've kind of fit, they've kind of fit well in the Redwood family. Um, but if somebody's, if somebody is just truly about the money, then some, some you, you'll ultimately end up getting your money, but you may not like where you get your money from and you may not like what happens to your business 24 months later or even 12 months later. So that's a little bit of some of that, you know, some of that exiting or succession planning may just have to do with, you know, either who becomes your partner or, you know, what was your plan to get, you know, to exit the business. And sometimes there's not a plan. And I think that's the first place is, develop a plan, develop a timeline and, 
and you know that'll usually lend lend to you know make decisions being made while you're in the planning mode not while you're in the frustrated mode for lack of a better term no it makes sense and and i and it's a good thing uh, money versus legacy right it's not always about the bottom dollar and i think some people also take that to say okay well, what about my team what about my people who's all involved who's going to stick around who's not going to stick around um after that according to the person that buys it right and not necessarily their own their own uh, thought process and like some people after an acquisition will likely you leave the business they might not like it uh, after the fact and so looking at i guess that that other uh, side of the coin once somebody has um in moving away from the family side of things and kind of into the actual purchase side of things um the i kind of want to say the dark side of pe in a sense and private equity and there is or just the dark side of 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 selling a business right what happens after the sale and we had uh victor rancour on last year that or last week that talked a little bit about this in terms of the emotions that went through him when he sold his business and all of a sudden he wakes up and it's just like oh shit, the baby's gone right um what are some of the the dark sides that people don't generally talk about when selling a business from the owner side of things the person that sold yeah, so there is an emotional attachment to the business. It's your baby. You know, you kind of started it. You know, I started something, you know, in, in 1993 that I purchased in 98 that, I, you know, that I sold in, in 2010. And the, the you know, the dark side of that can be you're still going to drive up and down the road and you're going to look at those trucks in the future. And you just want to make sure that you've put them in the hands of, Uh, And those people in a position, when you see those trucks, you're either proud to see those trucks or you're not proud to see the trucks based on what's, you know, what's going on in your business. And so from there is certainly an emotional attachment and uh, and there's an emotional side to a business. There's a to a transaction. So there's a financial side to a transaction. There's an emotional side to a transaction. And. And I can tell you the mo- from a guy who's done this before, the emotional side will stick around a lot longer than the financial side will. And and so be, you know, and, and all of that just is really determined on who's your partner. You know, like who do you, who do you choose to e- either sell a business to or take on an investor with? You know, um, we don't we you know, that's at least the way we think about it. That makes sense. Um I kind of want to go back to the debt thing um, because I think that's a fun story um, to be able to to go into. And, and looking at uh, you know, being almost a million dollars in in debt to carrier, and I don't know if there were there are other ones on there, but I know you you almost bankrupt the company um, and turn it around, right? Um, how I, I guess how did you end up in that spot in the first place to be able to say, oh shit, I almost bankrupt my dad's company after I just took it on. Yeah. Yeah. So good, good, um, good point. So first of all, how I, how you end up that way is, is just not charging the right price in the new construction business. So my business coach, Jim Hamilton, who was always my mentor, you know, Jim, um, uh, you know, Jim, first of all, taught me how to make money in new construction. So that helped. I like just couldn't get out of new construction because it was, you know, it had, it was a big, big part of the business. And, um, And so how we ended up there was one, just not charging the right price in the new construction industry, charging that going rate. That's why I mentioned to you kind of Mm -hmm. what's the myth in the industry. It's, it's going rate. And then going into the service and replacement business with that same mindset, you know, I called a flat rate company when I got ready, the flat rate company, when I got ready to get into the HVAC, you know, service side of the business. And and this is in 19, you know, 98. And I just said, Hey, you know, what do you guys, what should I charge? And the guy on the other end of the phone said, well, you should charge, you know, it's a reputable flat rate company. They said, well, what do you charge now? So, well, we charge $59 an hour. He said, well, you know, you can probably, you can probably charge a hundred dollars an hour and 125 on the weekend. I said, okay, great. Send me the book. You know, it sounds good. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they send me the book and I'm charging a hundred dollars an hour and 125 on the weekend. And I go through a year of it and I call the guy back and I say, Hey, uh, this didn't work very good. <laughs> like this, I, I, I already had a way to lose money, dude. I didn't need, need like another way to lose money. I thought the service and replacement industry is supposed to be good. He said, Hey, what you, what are you charging? I said, well, I'm charging, you know, hundred dollars an hour and 125 on the weekend. He said, well, you charge 125 an hour and 150 on the weekend. I said, cool. Send me the book. So good. he sends me, sends me the book. You know, I go through another year of it. I'm still bleeding. Now I'm just bleeding slower. So it's like a slow death. Mm-hmm. And I do that for like three years, Thaddeus, and 
And that's that's kind of where I landed at that that 942 in the hole. And as I and as I land at that 942 in the hole, I go, look, this is not working. And I and that's really when I ran into Nexstar, and I went to. Um, and this was, by the way, I, I like for people to hear these numbers because this was in 2004. I went to the next star boot camp at the boot camp. We did our break even our flat rate pricing. And at that boot camp, my flat rate pricing came out that my break even was 275 an hour and I should be charging about 385 an hour and excuse me, 335 an hour. And I called the flat rate company from the boot camp and I said, hey, dude, what? Like I just did this break even. It says I'm supposed to be charging like three thirty five an hour, and and he said, "Now where are you at?" And I said, "I'm in Memphis." He goes, "Oh yeah, most of those big metro areas they charge about three, you know, three fifty an hour." Or so I said, "Oh man, that'd be really nice to know." Like nine hundred forty two thousand dollars ago, right? <laughs> and um and so it really it really kind of started there is when we started digging out of the hole when we got the price right, and. A lot of people, when they hear, hey, you're charging 175 an hour and you need to go 335 an hour, you know, hey, should I raise my price a little bit? Should I raise it? Dude, rip the Band-Aid off. Get your price right. Right. Like, you doubled it, right? Yeah. I basically doubled the price overnight. And and then, you know, in, in reality today, you know, and I still sometimes I run into service companies today, Thaddeus, that are 20 years later still not charging 335 an hour flat rate. You need to be charging what it costs to run your business, period, you know, um, and and that's, you know, you owe it to your first of all, you owe it to your family, you owe it to yourself, you owe it to your employees, because as soon as I started charging the right price and we started making money, then all of a sudden our employee benefits went up. Mm -hmm. The type of trucks we drove went up, the amount of training we did and the things we did with Nextstar went up. And so, you know, it, if you're not going to charge the right price. You know, you you're you would just be better off, quite frankly, being an employee for somebody else. But you've essentially bought yourself a job at that point if you're not charging the right price, or worse, you've bought yourself a job and then you've ran up debt and now you're in debt. Um, and you can't get out of it. Like that's that's not a good way to to live and run. You know, I, th I th the other part too. I think some people are scared of the word profit in business and not having, especially if they don't know the the business side of things. And, and let's be real. I mean, when we're in the trades and any trade for that matter, a lot of people are on tools and they say, "Hey, I can start a business." And they don't have the business acumen or experience, and this is where best practice groups come in place because. Because they hear 20% profit and they're like, oh, I never know that I charge people. I, I'd be gouging people. I should just lower my prices to be able to not gouge people. Well, at the end of the day, you've got to be able to make a living to be able to pay your people the right way. I mean, shit, Tommy Mello is a good example of this. I mean, he knows that he's one of the most expensive in his market. But guess what? Every single one of his team members earns a six-figure salary. Like, yeah. okay, well, now you're taking care of your people. And when you take care of your people, guess what? You can, you're can you allowed to be able to do that and charge the price because the people are bought in. If you're, not, if you're paying them pennies on the dollar, they're never going to be able to go forward with a double double the pricing. So well, through that that experience, I mean, going from 175 to you know, three, 335 or 150 to 335, whatever the numbers were, essentially doubling the pricing overnight. What sort of impact did that have on any of your current clients and how did you then pos reposition yourself in the market? You know, one of the things that you talked about is is the right calls on the board, right? That's the first thing, by the way, when I talked about the, the four things uh, that we're going to talk about today, that's the first one is getting the right calls on the board. When you double your price, obviously that impacts a little bit of probably the call volume. So how did you transition for A, your current clients and B, prospective clients as they were coming in? Yeah, so good, good question. So one of the things I'll start with it, Thaddeus, is that if I go back to my steakhouse example that I used earlier, um, great the first example, gotta, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. The, the first thing you got to do is you got to prepare your employees for the price. The customer's actually not scared of the price. It's the employee that's scared of the price. It's the, it's the technician that's scared of the price. And so, you know, those, those guys that when I got out of new construction, I actually got out of new construction in 2008. I had to exit the business because of the recession. Um, but when I got out of the new construction business, went full service and replacement all in, in 2008, um, just four years after joining Nexstar. Um, the, the thing you got to do with that is you got to prepare your technicians, meaning they can't wear blue jeans and t-shirts anymore. I mean, you're a professional service company and you're going to charge a professional fee. So the waitress over at Logan's, when she, 
walks over to Jay Alexander's across the parking lot with blue jeans on, peanut shells on her boots, and her T-shirt tied up at the belly button, that's not going to work at Jay Alexander's. And so she's not going to be able to serve a $40 steak that way. And that's the same illustration you have to have with your technicians. I mean, you got, you know, the best way to say it is, hey, you want to get paid like a professional, look like a professional. You don't get paid like a bum, look like a bum. So it's not really, it's not really having to, your, your cu customers are used to paying for superior customer service and they will pay for it. So you don't have to really warm up your customer base to that too much. You just have to deliver the service and the customers will pay for it. I mean, you know, Toyota thought that people would pay for, you know, uh, wood grain dashboards and heated seats so much they created a company called Lexus. You know, Nissan thought, hey, hey, people will buy a, a, a nicer Pathfinder. So they created Infinity. You know, GMC years ago said, hey, somebody will buy a $150,000 Suburban. We'll call it an Escalade and put a new grill on it, you know, and and so at the end of the day, people will pay for the um, level of service that you will deliver. Mm -hmm. Well, they pay for the name, the brand, right? And that's also the big thing too with it. And that's where you look at uh, Toyota versus um, uh, you know, Lexus, right? The people see the Lexus and it's this prestige, right? And they know they're going to pay more for it. So in terms of getting the, and it's good that you, you mentioned the employee thing, because I think a lot of people miss that mark of getting the right uniform, right? It's that brand persona when people show up to the door and do you put booties on? Do you put a mat down? Do you, or do you have multiple shirts and pants inside the vehicle? So that way, if you get dirty, you can change into it. Is a vehicle clean on the outside and washing them daily? Uh, if it's dirty in your area, I mean, shit, <laughs> come to Canada in the springtime, right? You can wash, you can wash your vehicle 10 times a day and it still never be clean. Uh, but so people understand some of the nuances there if a person's driving around, right? Big, important things. In terms of the other part of the things of getting the right calls on the board, what other things should a business be looking at in order to ensure and maximize the right calls on the board? Well, good. One of the things to keep in mind with this right call thing is the first thing you got to realize, everybody's not your customer. So if you're a professional service company, everybody's not looking for a professional service company. Somebody's looking for Joe who works for the utility company to come by and fix it tonight when he gets off work. If he's not, if he doesn't have something to do with his family or this weekend, if he's not going to the lake and then you're going to try to compete with a guy on price, don't compete with him. You're a professional service company. So first of all, the right call has to do with, you know, who am I marketing to, you know, and some, and, you know, sometimes I, I use this analogy, like if you're marketing for $29 tune ups, you're going to get $29 customers. You know, if you're marketing for $129 tune-ups, you're going to get $129 customers. By the way, if the $29 or the $129 is a problem, everything after this is going to be a problem. And so, you know, some of it has to do with you marketing to the right zip codes. Um, you know, some of our some of our partners, we you know, we have a partner in Alexandria, Virginia. We have partners and we have a partner company in Phoenix. We have partner in Charlotte, where I'm at today. You know, these are those are extremely big markets, Indianapolis, Cincinnati. Sometimes you just can't market to the entire market. You know, find like your favorite customer and market to your favorite customer. Hmm. And owning your backyard, as Billy Stevens says, uh, yeah. when you own your backyard, now you can, you don't you also create efficiencies in your business too, because now you're not driving all over the market just to service a client. You could be being you know, like ping pong ball and all over the place. You can one central area works out uh, really good. So um, it, obviously marketing plays a role in that. And uh, I mean, if your marketing is not good, just call on purpose media. Uh, we'll help you out. But uh, yeah. perfect segue. <laughs> I had to slide that in there. So a uh, perfect segue into our random question generator. And so today's random question generator is brought to you by on purpose media, uh, the local home service marketing experts. If hey, like, if you need a second opinion on your marketing, you're not getting the right stuff on the board. We'll reach out to us on purpose media.ca. I will help you out. But uh, John, the random question generator is uh, just that. There are three random questions that I have here. You don't get to know what they are. You just have to choose. Do you want question one, two, or three? And then I'll read out the question to you. Sound fair? It sounds fair. All right. If you, uh, I guess um, I was about to read off one of the questions, but I know that's uh, <laughs> not going to read off the three questions. So what question uh, would you like? Question one, get, two, or three? Give me question number one. Question number one. All right. Uh, if you could donate a million dollars to any cause, what would it be? If I could donate a million dollars to any cause, it would probably be St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. Hmm. I'm assuming that's local in the Memphis area. 
It is Memphis, but it's uh, world renowned and uh, it's for doing cancer research for children. Hmm. Oh man, my heart. I can only imagine. I have a one-year-old and a three-year-old. So uh, the the stories that people share and show them, like, I hope that never happens uh, in my family. I hope it doesn't happen to any kid really for that matter. But um, yeah, great cause. Um, great choice. Um, yeah. And St. Jude is also um, there. They do not charge any patient a dime. And so they they literally operate uh, the entire hospital for over 50 years just on donations. So, wow. so if you ever get an opportunity to be in Memphis, set you up a tour, uh, change your life. Wow, that's well. And I mean, healthcare is different in Canada versus it, versus the U.S. versus other parts of the world. And to hear that they don't charge a dime uh, is absolutely wonderful and phenomenal, and an absolutely amazing cause. So uh, there you go. If anybody wants to rally around a great cause, uh, go donate to that hospital because uh, John will put forward a million dollars when he gets it. So that's uh, it. <laughs> that's awesome. it. Only needs a million dollars. So uh, perfect. Transitioning into, um, I mean, there's a bunch of different things uh, uh, the person can go into, and I think we've we've already covered a lot of ground so far. The second thing that you mentioned uh, to me before we got going is because, uh, again, it was built on the premise, by the way, of uh, for everybody that's listening, is that the business is actually not that complicated. Right. You mentioned to that earlier that it's really not that hard. It's actually keeping it simple. And that's your superpower. But people have a tendency to complicate it, which gets them down these rabbit holes of shiny object syndromes all the time. And, you know, 942 grand in debt, uh, which, by the way, that is a phenomenal story to be able to pay that off because not a lot of people would ever be able to do that. So um, second one, converting the call. So now you've got the right calls on the board. Now they're coming in. Now you've got to convert the call. Walk us through that. And what are some of the common pitfalls that people are experiencing or doing when it comes to converting the call? Yeah. So r- right before I jump into the to the perfect, I mean, to the converting the call, I just start with the, I'll just kind of go back real quick on the, you know, what's the simple part of this business, get the right calls on the board. What's the right calls, the right calls, basically, you know, the right calls basically means you need to be working for the right customer. Um, and you don't need to be working for the wrong customer who can be the wrong customer, you know, anyone who can't value your service. Mm -hmm. So, a home warranty company is not going to value your service. A property management company is not going to value your service. So get the right customers that you're dealing with and to make sure you have a, at least a, you know, a good percentage of aged equipment calls on the board, especially for HVAC or aged water heaters for plumbing. Um, so I'll just say this quickly and we'll jump into conversion. So get the right calls, convert the calls, charge the right price, you win. Mm-hmm. And we just have a tendency to complicate the crap out of this business. And it's just not that complicated. Like get the calls, convert the calls, charge the right price, you win. Mm-hmm. And and so, um, but then we go, you know, wrong, we go get the wrong calls. Uh, then we, and we don't have any type of process and we don't dispatch accordingly and we can't convert them. Uh, and then we don't charge the right price because we're supposed to charge going rate. And when, then we lose and we go, I don't know why I'm not winning. Mm-hmm. where, you, you know, you got all three of them screwed up there. So, um, so uh, on converting the call, um, you know, the, the actual converting of the call and, and just for a little clarity or definition, most service companies will define a converted call as anything above the diagnostic fee that you charge to go out. Mm. So if you're a company that charges $79 to go out and your technician goes out there he collects $79 and he doesn't do anything above $79 and he leaves with $79. That's not a converted call. Your technician goes out there and you can keep it as simple as a, a, does a seven, you know, goes out there, collects $79. The customer needs a filter change. I don't know, maybe he charges 20 bucks for a filter and he leaves with $99. Okay. That's a converted call. So anything above the amount that I charge to go out is a converted call. Um, Obviously, different calls convert at different rates, but, um, you know, conversion has a lot to do um, also with just how thorough your technician is. You know, my HVAC service manager, Chris, he used to say, hey, pay the price for success and the price for success is thoroughness. And so um, years ago, um, Thaddeus Consumer Reports asked homeowners, what brand heating and air conditioning system do you have? And um, I don't know. Did you ever hear what the answer to that was? No. The answer was Honeywell. Hmm. And the reason it was Honeywell is because the customer views it as a system. We all know Honeywell does not make heating and air conditioning systems. They only make thermostats. 
customers view it as a system. We're the guys who turned it into a furnace, coal, and an air conditioner. So start treating the system like a system and stop treating it like a furnace or an air conditioner. And um, in that, you'll do a, a more thorough inspection for your customer and you'll convert at a higher percentage. No, that makes sense. And um, <clears throat> because really like in, in converted call can be anything uh, when a call comes in, I booked it. Okay. Converted call. Um, in, but taking it to this uh, next level of, okay, well, I've got the call on the board and now it's uh, anything above the diagnostic fee. What would you, kind of a tricky answer, I think. Um, I'm kind of giving you an out already because uh, you said different calls convert at different levels. Uh, average conversion rate, if you were to blend all of the calls together that um, a traditional business would get, uh, what would you want to see for a conversion rate? Well, typically, if you're running maintenance calls, these are customers who have your agreement. And typically that's about a 35% conversion rate call. These are, these are when you're actually running their maintenance visit, you know, um, mm -hmm. I'll, you can make the math easy and say one out of three of them should convert to something other than just their, the fee they pay for the maintenance. Uh, when you're looking at an HVAC demand call, um, it, that, that number is going to be, if you're a company that turns over a lot of leads to comfort advisors or sells a lot of systems, you're probably going to convert about 65% of that to service. And then about 20% of them are going to turn into some type of lead or sale. Um, and then you'll just have, you know, on the demand side, these are people that have a problem. You just may have 5% of people that don't do anything, you know, either they can't afford it or, you know, they thought your price was too high or they didn't, you know, didn't like the way your guy parked his truck or whatever. Um, so typically on demand calls, about 65% conversion rate on demand, 20% of the, the aged calls or 20% of those calls will turn into a lead and about 35% on the maintenance side. Perfect. Well, those are some good numbers for people to try for. What do you, what do you normally see um, businesses at? So I guess when you, you guys probably do a deep dive on some of the partners that you bring on and before and after, et cetera, um, what are some of the average numbers that you currently see? Um, I mean, those are ideal. What do you normally see from other businesses? I mean, you know, sometimes partners and, and even in my Nexstar days, I coached 111 companies at Nexstar. And um, even at Nexstar, you would, see, you know, sometimes people might struggle a little bit with conversion on maintenance calls. And so that might that number might be more in the, you know, you might see them in the 20 to 25 percent range. Uh, a lot of that has to do with sometimes technicians will get head trash about maintenance calls. So they thought oh, it's not a good call. This is another maintenance call. But in reality, if you think about it, this is actually a customer who pays extra money to have their system service. So mm -hmm. typically they're actually a better call. But uh, a lot of those a lot of the results when I say call or job, when we when we run an actual service call, a lot of the results were really to de be determined by how the technician you know runs the call so if he thinks it's a bad call it's probably going to be a bad call mindset you know? and yeah it's in the, it's in their in their mindset um yep. and then on conversion rate on demand i mean you know those numbers i shared with you are, are you know we're certainly achieving those and sometimes above those you know you, you know you may get you know you may do get to a situation where if you're converting on the hvac side really high on on demand calls but really low on technician, I mean, excuse me, really low on tech generated leads, then there might be just an, a situation where you're repairing too much. Like you may have systems that need to be turned over, but they're not getting turned over. They're getting, they're getting repaired. Um, so once that system gets over about 10 years old, um, you typically see about 60% of them will turn into a lead. Um, but this is all, if you're following a process, if you have no mm -hmm. process at all, and you're just haphazardly sending technicians to run calls, and just doing whatever they want to do, um, then these numbers are going to be Greek to you. Mm -hmm. uh, well, and <laughs> it, I think a lot of them are, are Greek to some people, right? Because they just don't know. They don't even know where to begin to even find that data or analyze that data. Well, if you're doing things in the right CRM system or FSM system, well, that's a lot of your data is right there. Um, be able to do that, which also blends into the, the to the third one is charge the right price. And we've already kind of went along a lot, I think, on charging the right price itself with the, the stories that you had uh, from the beginning. But if somebody were to, to listen, okay, well, um, I hear that you at one point were 150, now we're 300, making the numbers up just for math. You had to double it overnight, could be 200 to 400, whatever. Um, and this break even 
analysis of this break even point that you referenced if you're to tell if you're to coach somebody uh, through how to find this break even number what would you tell them because i think some people just don't know yeah there's a lot of um, best practices groups out there that can help you with that you know there's probably some calculators online to determine break even there's there's flat rate companies actually have a tool to determine what break even is service titan i think can even help you determine you know what your break even is there may be some you know, Excel spreadsheets or uh, on, you know, on break even. So that's the, um, but, you know, just kind of learning, you know, you really just kind of break it down to like, how much does it cost to run my company? You know, how, you know, and then how many hours uh, am, is a technician available to sell in a year? And, uh, and how many technicians do you have? So you can kind of do the math and go, I got 10 technicians and they're going to work 2000 hours and, you know, if they can sell, you know, 40% of their time, then this is, you know, this is how many hours they have available to sell. And this is what it costs to run my company. So now you at least know, well, that's at least my break even to cover my operating expenses. And then I, of course, I have to add their hourly rate and I have to add profit. Um, and then you can charge a reasonable markup on your parts, you know, and so it, it there's a formula that kind of goes into it. But it, it really starts with what it costs to run your company. And, and you know, Th- Thaddeus, sometimes in our industry, people get their head wrapped around, you know, I buy a capacitor for $15 and I'm, and this thing says I'm supposed to sell it for 275. How do I buy a part for $15 and sell it for 275? Am I ripping somebody off? Is that not right? Well, where you, where you have to get to in this industry today, and I'm sure it this, it's this way in Canada as well, is, what we pay for parts today almost has nothing to do with what we sell them for. Mm-hmm. Um, and people can't get their mind wrapped around that. They think they think there there is some multiplier of the price. And, and in reality, they just can't get their mind wrapped around the fact that what it really costs to run a company is what determines how much you charge for that capacitor, not what you pay for the capacitor. And, right. and that's a mindset shift um for that people have to get their mind wrapped around is just kind of understanding you know what does it cost to run my company and because there's uh, the way i say it is look there there are only two people paying in this scenario either your customer's paying or you're or you're paying Mm. and if your paying exceeds the customer paying welcome to 942 in the hole Well, and the other part, like you kind of alluded to it, of, of that that price, well, there's the insurance, there's the fuel, there's the deli- like driving to get it, there's your guy's time in order to be able to go get it. And now one could argue, well, you should stock a bunch of them. Okay, cool. Well, you're still going to have to pay all those other things in terms of getting it out there. And so there's a lot of extra plus, plus, plus that a lot of people just forget completely all about, um, <clears throat> which is that that big thing. So uh, now um, making sure that price is right, um, shifting into that last one is you win, right? I think that's a pretty easy one because if you've got the right calls on the board, you're converting the call and you're charging the right price, well, that's where you then win. Yeah, abs- absolutely. And, and the, you know, what is what does win mean? You know, win is kind of where freedom shows up. You know, some of the uh, some of the guys that you mentioned uh, earlier, Victor and Tommy Mello and some of those guys, those guys are winners, you know, and, mm-hmm. and they didn't win by being the cheapest guy in town. You know, mm-hmm. they won by charging the right price. I was I was on a conversation with one of our partners last week, and it kind of occurred to me out of the blue that our partner who has the av- the highest average sale for an HVAC install um, is also our partner who has the highest conversion rate wait a minute, that can't be right. I thought everybody wanted cheap. Like, oh, if I charge less, I'm going to convert more. No, the, our partner of, you know, of 15 partner companies nationwide and several hundred comfort advisors nationwide, the, the, the partner who has the highest average sale is also the partner who has the highest conversion rate. Only about 15% of consumers make decisions based on price. 85% of consumers will make decisions based on something other than price. If you don't give them anything other than price to make a decision on, they'll certainly just make it on price. Mm-hmm. However, if all your customers are about price, there is something that you're doing that's making it about price. Mm-hmm. Like they don't all know each other. They don't all go, hey, 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 Thaddeus is on the way. You better talk him down. 
Like they don't all know each other. And they're not calling each other saying that there's something wrong with your price. If if every one of your customers or every is about price, your techs are making it about price. Mm. Um, and when you're and if everything's going to be about price, you can't win, you know. And what does win mean? It means greater benefits for your employees. It means greater health insurance. It means retirement plan. It means recurring incentive plans for agreement sales. It means newer trucks. It means newer tools. It means running a state of the art facility, you know, um, and that's what winning looks like. And people want to be on a winning team and it, and it means being able to pay people, you know, what you should be paying them. I was, talking to an electrical manager today and he was telling me about one of his best electricians who made $82,000 last year. I said, Hey, that ain't going to work. I mean, you need like, you need like 130, $140,000 a year electricians, not $80,000 electricians. Like show that guy how to make $140,000 a year and change his life. Um, and, and we've certainly seen that with partners across the nation um, where, you know, where people make more money than they've ever made before. And, it's, it's phenomenal. It's gratifying. It's good to see. I love that. And, and really that winning has so much bigger things than just an individual, right? Does your team win? Does everybody else win? Does the customer win? Because they're getting a great, great experience uh, as well. It's a trans, it translates into every aspect of the business when you want to win a business, well, everything else wins and, and goes from that way. So yeah, now you mentioned Redwood and what you guys do a few times. Um, Walk us through. I mean, thank you for dropping all the value so far before we get into what you guys do. Um, so what exactly is it that Redwood does and how are you guys different from others in the market? You know, we basically invest in partnerships. And one of the things that we know makes us different, we in the early days, four years ago, we used to think, oh, we think this makes it different. Now, 15 partners later, we know this makes us different. And the big difference is that we invest in partnerships. We don't buy companies you know, we don't treat people like they've been, you know, they've been bought. Um, and we, we quite frankly, um, have a, a very people first mentality. Um, and, and that quite frankly, you know, extends to, like I said, 14 of our 15 owners are still in place and they're still running their business day to day. And um, I, I think one of the big differentiators um, for us also is uh, you hear a lot about PE out there and you hear a lot of uh, quite frankly, some of the stories are, are very um, disappointing and they're not very good to hear. Um, and sometimes Richard and I know that we get thrown in that bucket. Um, but in reality, um, Redwood is not PE. So um, we are basically funded by uh, investors um, who believe in our people first strategy, who believe in not rebranding the company, who believe in not changing out the management team, who believe in not having a centralized payroll, who believe in, you know, not doing your marketing for you. And, and quite frankly, because of our investors um, basically just uh, allow the management team at Redwood to successfully run the business. I mean, we're, we're literally coming along the side of some of the best operating companies in the nation. And we're literally adding fuel to these businesses um, without running their business for them, without making their decision. You know, if one of our car partners calls and says, Hey, John, how do you, how do you want me to pay your, t my technicians, keep paying your technicians the way you've been paying them. And by the way, if you don't like the way you're paying them, then I'm glad to give you some help on how to pay technicians or here's 14 phone numbers of our other partners, call them and ask them how they pay them. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, um, I, you know, I, I would just say for, for people who look for a partner, um, Redwood is a great place. Um, people who um, are looking to grow their business and they're looking to compete at a high level. You know, we have 15 partners um, nationwide um, that do a phenomenal job at running their company and taking care of their people. And, and, you know, we didn't come alongside them to do their job for them. And we don't know how to market their business in Memphis better than they do in, you know, Minneapolis, St. Paul or Alexander, Virginia. And so we're just, we're excited to be their partner and, We've got a phenomenal team of support and um, we're, you know, continuing to invest in the home services industry because of our structure and we've got a great team and uh, somebody needs me, reach out to me. I'd be glad to talk to you about an opportunity. 
Perfect. Well, and in order to be able to do that, John at redwoodservices.com is his email. If you want to check out their website, redwoodservices.com over there. And love the fact that you guys bring in your systems and your processes and bring it into the business and don't don't change a whole heck of a lot, really, because I think a lot of times kind of goes back to the very beginning part when somebody sells the emotional decision and especially if they completely exit and then somebody comes in and guts their team. Well, now those people are out, right? And not everybody wants that. And so this is another way to uh, up level one's uh, business uh, while still maintaining uh, everybody that is inside the business itself. So um, thank you for taking the time uh, today, John, to to chat with us, share some knowledge, share those uh, the four things of uh, the right calls on the board, converting the call, charging the right price, and then winning um, great uh, four parts to uh, the simplicity of, of, of the business. But before we do, I do have one final question here for you, though. Yep. All right. What is one question that you wish people would ask you more, but don't? <laughs> uh, man, that's a good one. That's a good one. What is the one question that I wish people asked me more, but they don't? Um, I think, um, man, that gets, dang, that's tough. Um, um, maybe in the one question would be, um, how many grandkids I have? Mm, well, how many grandkids do you have? I have three grandkids. A one that's about to be five, and one's about to be three, and one's about to be one. So that's mm. the phenomenal part uh, of the business. That uh, that's kind of why I do what I do. Yeah, to be able to spend the time with them. That's and it. Enjoy and spoil them rotten. So, like any grandparent should do to their to their to their grandkids, except for my mom. Don't listen to this, mom. Do not spoil our kids rotten. No, <laughs> she already does. She already takes care of them uh, quite well. And so, uh, but that's the thing. It's like when you're a grandparent, you get all the cuddles without the struggles. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's right. We load yeah. them up with sugar and we send them home, right? Exactly. I was about to say that exact same thing. You fill them up with sugar and they say, okay, bye, your problem now. Uh, payback's a bitch. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, yeah, it's uh, we, we're already starting to see that with our second kid because he's a climber and just doesn't listen. You'd be like, he, he, you're like, don't climb on the table. Uh, and he, they have like the little kid's table or whatever. And he climbs up there and I'm like, get down. He looks at you and starts laughing and keeps doing his thing. I'm like, okay, you know that I'm telling you to get down. You're just defiant. Uh, oh yeah. Is. So yeah, my mom is, uh, probably saying payback. So, uh, there we go. But, uh, great question. Uh, glad that you're, uh, you're spoiling the grandkids rot and you're filling them, fully filling them with sugar and sending them home uh, all hyped up. So, uh, Thank you for uh, taking the time today, John, uh, to chat uh, with me. Uh, sadly, you haven't missed a great conversation, so I'll have to catch up later. So um, <clears throat> as we right. sign off every uh, every time, I guess until next time, cheers. Cheers. Well, that's a wrap on another episode of HVAC Success Secrets Revealed. Before you go, two quick things. First off, join our Facebook group, facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash HVAC Revealed. The other thing, if you took one tiny bit of information out of this show, no matter how big, no matter how small, all we ask is for you to introduce this to one person in your contacts list. That's it. That's all. One person. So they too can unleash the ultimate HVAC business. Until next time. Cheers.